Greetings from the College of Southern Nevada. I am uh, Dr. Francis Joseph Carlton, uh, tenured faculty in the Department of Social Sciences, and I teach within the Political Science Program here at CSN. And I'm here to help CSN celebrate Constitution Day 2022. And as part of that, my contribution is going to be a, uh, a brief presentation on the Supreme Court's recent decision in, in Dobbs handed down over this past summer on abortion and private privacy rights and the Bill of Rights. So without further ado, let me just roll right into that. So we know then that the Supreme Court back in 1973 in a famous case called Roe v. Wade held that uh, some combination of the protections of, contained in the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause amounted to uh, the creation of a zone of privacy that protects we the people from a potentially coercive government. And, uh, and in the court's view, included within that zone of privacy is a woman's fundamental right of access to an abortion. All right, so that's Roe. Uh, now the court did say, look, we need to balance this with the state's interest in a potential citizen in the form of a developing fetus. So they essentially said that during the first two trimesters of a pregnancy, a woman has uh, uh, pretty much an unfettered right to seek an abortion in consultation with uh, her doctor. Uh, but once that third trimester arrives in a pregnancy, the final three months of a pregnancy, then the state has a compelling interest in the potential life of a citizen, and they can exert that interest uh, by regulating abortion as they see fit, with the exception of cases uh, that uh, involve the woman's uh, life or health. So there has to be that as an exception to the general rule that states can regulate abortion as they see fit from the third trimester on. All right. And some states, right, would choose, therefore, to criminalize all abortions in the third trimester. Others might, might not. It's going to be up to each state, right? Uh, by 1992, the court had become more conservative because of a string of Republican presidents like Reagan and uh, George H.W. Bush Sr. And uh, the court modified Roe in a case called Casey, 1992. And there they said, well, you know, what we're really concerned about is not so much a trimester framework, but we're concerned about fetal viability. So let's just use that as our standard for when the states can intervene as they see fit. Fetal viability is when states can step in. And, you know, that's that's sort of has shifted a little bit over the years, right, because of evolving medical technologies. Uh, but if you were to rough it out, right, it might be around week 24 or so. All right, so this decision means that states can intervene as they see fit at an earlier uh, point in the pregnancy, fetal viability. Um, but you still have that life or health of the mother exception. And then maybe most importantly, Casey allowed the states to regulate access to abortion to a limited degree prior to fetal viability, so long as any such regulations did not infringe on a woman's fundamental right to access an abortion. Uh, no undue burdens, no regulations that pose an undue burden prior to fetal viability. Right, so this has given states a certain amount of room to impose regulations like, uh, you know, you have to get counseling from the state prior to getting an abortion. Uh, and states can use that as they have to make the case against abortion to the patient. Uh, and then you have to wait a certain number of hours, like usually 24 to 48 hours after you receive that advice to when you actually make a decision on abortion. Uh, and they've done some other fairly creative things over the years to use that undue burden standard to press the envelope on limits they could impose that might discourage a woman from getting an abortion. All right. So that was Casey 1992. That was kind of a compromise. I, I, I myself see that as a compromise between the two sides, right? Because uh, Roe came down decisively on the side of pro-choice. Uh, Casey tries to split the difference between pro-choice and pro-life. And I thought, again, in my view, 
But that was a pretty good compromise for both sides. It didn't make either side very happy, but maybe that's the sign of a good compromise, right? So that's where we were prior to the summer of 2022. And then you get the court in Dobbs, where they're looking at a, uh, a Mississippi regulation that basically banned abortions after the 15th week, which is well pre-fetal viability. So you know, it, essentially, it essentially challenged the premise of Casey. And we still use Roe, I understand why. We still use Roe v. Wade as kind of, that represents right the, the uh, pro-choice position on abortion. But realistically, in some ways, we're now governed much more by Casey than we are by, by Roe v. Wade until the summer of 2022. Um, yes. And in, in, the, in this, that, that, this past summer, right, the court indeed arrives at, at the opposite conclusion. And look, even in Roe v. Wade, there were dissenting justices who said, no, this isn't right. There is no right to privacy in the, in the Bill of Rights. There's nothing specific to abortion in the Bill of Rights. You can't make this sort of a broad, ambiguous argument that there's a zone of privacy and within that is a right to an abortion. That's all made up. And unless it's explicitly defended in the Constitution, forget about it. Right? So that view among the judiciary has been out there you know, since the beginning. That, that side wins, right, in Dobbs. Uh, the court, and that, that becomes a larger story, right, about how Republicans were able to uh, snatch away an appointment from President Obama, and then Trump ended up with three appointments in, in four years, which is crazy, all right? And so that shifts the court decisively to the right on all sorts of issues, including, of course, abortion. So now you've got, right, a court that's geared towards, indeed, a pro-life position. And it comes out exactly that way in Dobbs, as you might have expected. This was really anticipated with the leaked memo and all of that, right? The draft opinion by Alito. Uh, so, so the court in Dobbs indeed does what we expected it to do. It, uh, it rejects the, the basic premise of Roe and therefore the basic premise of Casey, which is that there is a right to privacy in the Bill of Rights that's not explicitly mentioned linguistically, but, but is conceptually included with the within the ambit of that document. I used the 14th Amendment's due process clause to uh, apply this to the states. Um, and that's all rejected by the court, right, in Dobbs. Now rejected, I would say, by a vote of five to four. Right, five to four is really the, the ruling on that larger issue of is, is Casey or Roe still good law, i.e., is there a right to privacy encoded in the Bill of Rights? Five to four. It's a narrow win for conservatives, but a win, right? And a big win, a big deal. Uh, because we end up, right, if you look at the, the result in that case, it was six to three, right? But, but part of that majority was Chief Justice John Roberts, moderate Republican. And his position was, I agree with the result in this case, that we uphold the Mississippi law that essentially bans abortions after 15 weeks. I'm good with that. But let's, let's, let's put the line there, right? To sort of move it from fetal viability to 15 weeks. Recognizing that there is a right to privacy in the Bill of Rights. It does include access to abortion, but states have more degrees of freedom to regulate that as they see fit, starting at 15 weeks. And I, I don't know that he argued this specifically, but presumably maintaining that health or life of the, of the mother exception after 15 weeks. All right, uh, that was Robert's position. That I like the result in this case. We uphold the Mississippi law. Great, but let's use that as the new standard. That's where his five more conservative brethren disagreed and said, no, we want to go further than that. We want to just abolish the right altogether and say it doesn't exist. The court got it wrong in row. We're fixing that and uh, returning to the correct reading of the Constitution. That if you want abortion to be a protected right, it's got to be explicitly mentioned in the Bill of Rights. It's not. Or it has to be encoded into federal law. It's not. All right. So that's that's the position of the of the five uh, is that, you know, we're going we're going all the way here in eliminating access to abortion as a fundamental right. No more line drawing. So that's where Roberts disagrees with his more conservative brethren on the jurisprudence that emerges from Dobbs. And then, of course, right, the three uh, more liberal justices, of course, disagree completely and say, strike down the Mississippi law, stick with Casey. There is a right to privacy. 
and it, it, it protects a woman's access to abortion right up to fetal viability. All right, so, so we kind of blow up the Casey Compromise. Kaboom! Blow it up. Uh, here we are. Right, here we are. It is now September of 2022, and we're starting to see the fallout. It's been intriguing, right? It, all sorts of fallout. Uh, battles over, perhaps. Uh, does a state constitution protect the right of access to abortion? That's been the ruling in some states that perhaps there's state constitutional protections for abortion rights. Because um, now it's going to be fought state by state, right? State by state. Um, um, what else has, has the court the court's been looking at here? It's not some of it's been blowback from we the people and public opinion. We saw that. Uh, ballot measure in, in Kansas, in which the question was, you know, should we uh, allow the legislature in Kansas to uh, deal with abortion as they see fit, or should we maintain the status quo, pre-dubs? And, and overwhelmingly, the people of Kansas, which is a pretty conservative state, the people of Kansas said, no, status quo. We like the status quo. We like the Casey Compromise, is what essentially they said. That caught a lot of people by surprise. Right? So we're getting blowback here. Uh, I think pro-choice forces also are, are mobilizing in response to this. Right? Some say that the electoral fallout might be significant. It might help Democrats keep control of the Senate after the 2022 midterms. It might help them pick up uh, some governorships, that sort of thing. Right? We saw some form of that in Kansas. Uh, we saw Democrats do well in a couple special elections in Alaska and, um, oh, and in some other dang state, New York upstate New York. All right, so there's been some interesting electoral consequences because polling data did show that for the most part, a majority of Americans support Casey, kind of the compromise position. Um, you know, it's, it's that old Oscar Wilde maxim, right? Be careful what you wish for, you might get it. Because at some level, it feels to me at times, like maybe uh, pro- uh, pro-life forces ha have gotten what they wanted for so long, right? The overturning of Roe and Casey. And now it seems like they've caught a tiger by the tail and, and don't quite know what to do with it. Uh, they got what they wished for and maybe they didn't anticipate the backlash. And that seems to be where we're at. We'll get some you know, greater clarity on that after the midterms. But... Uh, events between the Dobbs decision and today are suggestive, that there has been some backlash, that Americans, by and large, supported the Casey Compromise, and uh, many see uh, the court's new position as not entirely legitimate. It's also undercut the court's legitimacy, by the way. Uh, you know, I would say, speaking as a political scientist, like from a purely jurisprudential standpoint, I can kind of see where the court's coming from in Dobbs. Right there, that's always I've always thought that jurisprudentially that was the difficulty with Roe v. Wade, and therefore Casey, was that you know you don't see clear language in the Bill of Rights protecting a woman's right of access to abortion. Although right, we're often left with that dilemma with our Constitution, where the wording is often vague and ambiguous, and you got to fill in the gaps as best you can, here in the present. And you know each generation has to make its own choices about the meaning of the Constitution. Uh, the Ninth Amendment suggests that we should read the Bill of Rights broadly, that just because they're not listed here doesn't mean we don't still have them, is what the Ninth Amendment says, basically a statement of natural law, that we have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that could mean any number of things. Uh, so, so there are legal arguments in favor of the logic of Roe and Casey, of course. Uh, but if you're kind of, you know, pro-choice, you would prefer that we had something clearer to work with here. You know, the court did take a leap of faith of sorts in Roe v. Wade. That there's a right of privacy, not explicitly mentioned, and it includes abortion. So jurisprudentially, I, I see where the court majority is in Dobbs, but I also think that at some level, and people sometimes find this troubling, but I think it's just true, to some extent the court depends on support from the public for its power and legitimacy. Now, some, you know, It's been said that a court that gets too far out of step with we the people starts to lose power institutionally because right, it has neither the power of the sword nor the power of the purse, just the power to persuade. And once they lose that, they lose a lot. Right? And there are data that show that uh, our view of the court has slid downhill since the Dobbs decision.
course, so has the presidency and, and Congress and, and, and the media and so forth. Right? We're, we, the people, are losing trust in all of our governing institutions, and that certainly now includes the Supreme Court. Yeah, so these are some things to think about. And then one other thing I would leave you with before I leave um, would be, uh, you know, right, so once the court claims that there is no right to privacy in the Constitution, that doesn't just implicate abortion, right? It also implicates potentially uh, same-sex marriage. Um, and some say that's the court's next target, uh, that they should uh, reverse their position on same-sex marriage and open it up to states to do as they see fit. Although there's, you know, there's a move afoot in Congress to encode this into federal law, the right to uh, same-sex marriage. Uh, right now, at this moment, on this day, we're not sure it's going to quite get through. It, it, it can get through the House, maybe it already has, but get it, getting it through the Senate right, is going to require 60 votes, which means 10 Republicans and 50 Democrats. Definitely have 50 Democrats. It's not clear there are 10 Republicans. I think they're close to getting 10, but they're not there yet. So at this point, any federal bill enshrining that right uh, is going to come up a little short until there's 10 Republicans. Um, yeah. So this could have further implications. Right? I think Justice Thomas, the court's most conservative member, did write a separate opinion, a concurring opinion in Dobbs, in which he expressed a desire to take this logic and go further. Uh, whether that'll happen or not, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, and, and again, keep in mind here, deep background, right? states own abortion, can now do as they see fit. So in many states, like Nevada or California, on abortion, near as I can tell, nothing's going to change. States like Mississippi, right, Alabama, Texas, things are going to be changing a lot, and in some cases already have. All right, so I'm going to leave it there. Uh, yeah, the Dobbs decision, just jurisprudentially, is very interesting, right? The meaning of the Bill of Rights here in the year 2022, but politically, right, and electorally, this is also a very significant issue and case. Uh, and, uh, you know, the court has always been at the center of our, of our politics, and, and it certainly is in, in the Dobbs decision. I don't think it can avoid that, even if it wanted to. And I know Chief Justice John Roberts has suggested that he's not too, too good with where the court's headed these days. He's, he feels like he's being outflanked to the right uh, on uh, all sorts of issues involving the, the interpretation of the U.S. Constitution. So I'm going to leave it there. Thanks all. And again, happy, happy Constitution Day circa 2022. Uh, take care and be well.